Good morning and uh, welcome to today's USC Brookings Schaefer Initiative webinar on innovation in Alzheimer's disease. My name is Leonard Schaefer. As a trustee of both the Brookings Institution and the University of Southern California, I'm pleased that so many have joined us for what promises to be an engaging discussion. Over the past many years, there's been a growing list of biomedical breakthroughs to treat different diseases, including cardiovascular disease, cancer, and infectious disease. But unfortunately, Alzheimer's has been absent from that list. This is extremely worrisome for many reasons. Alzheimer's is the only disease among the 10 leading causes of death in the US that can't be prevented, slowed, or cured. Modeling suggests that without an effective intervention, the prevalence of Alzheimer's and other dementias will triple over the next several decades. And as many of us know firsthand, this disease has devastating effects on patients, their families, and society. In addition, the costs associated with Alzheimer's will create an unsustainable economic future for our country. The annual cost of Alzheimer's in the US is projected to reach $1.5 trillion by 2050. But at today's webinar, we're finally going to hear some good news on recent advances in treatments and diagnostics, including early treatments, even before cognition starts to decline. We're very fortunate to have Dr. Paul Azen with us, a global leader in Alzheimer's clinical trials and the director of the USC Alzheimer's Therapeutic Research Institute, who will update us on the clinical landscape. And then we'll hear from health economist Darius Lakawana Director of Research at the USC Schaefer Center, who will discuss the value of these interventions for individuals and society. Both presentations will be followed by panel discussions and audience questions moderated by Dana Goldman, Director of the Schaefer Center. One housekeeping note before we begin. You can send questions at any time during the program using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. So now let's turn to Dr. Paul Azen, will describe why there's reason to be hopeful about future clinical advancers to treat Alzheimer's. Dr. Azen. Thanks so much. And thank you to everybody for joining us uh, today. All right, so on this first slide, I've summarized the points that I wanna make in this uh, brief uh, discussion. We've been working on therapeutics for decades in Alzheimer's disease and after some initial success in developing modestly effective symptomatic treatments such as denepazil, we've really struck out in our efforts to develop disease slowing treatments. And really that is the, among the greatest needs in healthcare today. So uh, we've had a long period of frustrating um, delays and disappointments, but the good news that I do want to share today is that We've learned a great deal, and we are confident that we are now close to uh, bringing to the clinic effective disease-modifying treatments. I'm going to make several points today. First, we've, we've rethought uh, what Alzheimer's disease is. We now view it as a disease over many years, a continuum, and I'm going to show you that uh, in the coming slides. We're very confident that we understand what drives Alzheimer's disease. It's the accumulation of an abnormal protein in the brain called amyloid. And we believe that very early intervention targeting this driving abnormality, amyloid, is going to be effective to a substantial extent in slowing Alzheimer's disease. We have learned in the, in the last few years how to bring our trials to the very earliest stage, the asymptomatic stage. And most recently, there have been breakthroughs in the development of blood tests that demonstrate the pathology of Alzheimer's disease uh, very easily and efficiently. And all of these advances have brought us close to breakthrough treatment for AD. So here is the traditional view of this disease. 
Alzheimer's disease. It's uh, uh, been thought of as a dementia, and a dementia just means cognitive impairment severe enough to interfere with daily life. And we've thought that Alzheimer's disease starts with mild dementia and then progresses over a period of seven to 10 years to death. It's always been understood to be a uniformly fatal disease, but it's been considered to start with dementia and last uh, seven to 10 years. We've really reconsidered this completely. Using biomarkers, which are indicators of disease pathology using biological tools, we have reconsidered what this disease is, and we now know that Alzheimer's disease is not a seven to 10 year process, it's a 25 year process. And our traditional view that Alzheimer's disease is defined as dementia with a, pre, uh, a phase that precedes dementia that's called mild cognitive impairment, while useful in clinical practice is not useful in the development of drugs because it ignores most of the disease and it ignores the part of the disease that is likely to be amenable to disease modifying treatment. Now that we can clearly identify amyloid accumulation in brain and follow the level of amyloid in brain, we can accurately define who is on the Alzheimer's disease continuum and we can conduct our trials at the right stage of disease. So this is the way we see the disease now. Uh, it's a continuum that starts with amyloid accumulation and this is shown in the red line on this graph. Time is, is shown on the horizontal axis and the time of the disease is roughly 25 years from the accumulation of amyloid in brain. The clinical manifestations of the disease, and that's just shown in the green uh, curve on the right, the loss of function because of progressive cognitive impairment is only the end stage of the disease. And between the start, the amyloid accumulation, and the end, the loss of function, many things are observable that indicate the progression of this disease. In the asymptomatic stage, we have uh, measures such as amyloid PET and tau PET that show the disease progressing. And we have measures that progress and accurately demonstrate where we are in the disease across the in entire spectrum. And this way of looking at the disease opens up new possibilities for drug development. Biomarkers have been key. So we used to talk about Alzheimer's disease as probable Alzheimer's disease because we were never sure whether disease existed before autopsy because it was invisible to us, invisible on CAT scans and MR scans. But that's all changed. Now we have PET scanning that can show the primary abnormalities of Alzheimer's disease. And the early abnormality is the accumulation of amyloid in brain. And we can see that with an amyloid PET scan. And we can see it by sampling cerebrospinal fluid by lumbar puncture and we can accurately identify individuals who are on the Alzheimer's disease spectrum even many years before the onset of symptoms. And then we can follow the progression of the disease with other biomarkers. We can see the second principal lesion, the tangle, with a tool called tau-PET, and we can characterize the progression of disease in terms of atrophy, on MR scans and biochemical changes in cerebrospinal fluid. And as I'll talk about in a bit, we can now see the progression of the disease with blood tests as well. I wanna emphasize two major developments over just the last couple of years in the field. And one is the story of aducanumab, which is the leading candidate therapeutic that's currently under review at the FDA. And the second is this uh, breakthrough in the use of blood tests to help us see Alzheimer's disease and develop therapies. 
So let's start with aticanumab. This is a complicated story and I'd love to spend more time and maybe we'll talk more about this in the discussion period. But what aticanumab is, is a, a monoclonal antibody. So antibodies are the primary component of our immune system. We can manufacture antibodies that attack the amyloid that I've just explained is what initiates and drives Alzheimer's disease. We've actually developed antibodies that can clear amyloid from brain, and this is remarkable. If amyloid's the key to the disease, we now have a tool to eliminate amyloid, and aducanumab is an example of an antibody that normalizes amyloid in brain. Normalizing amyloid at the dementia stage has not been very successful because the dementia stage is the end stage when the brain is severely damaged in an irreversible way. But the use of biomarkers has allowed us to apply treatments such as aducanumab at a pre-dementia stage. And in the development of this antibody, the concept of early AD, which is biomarker confirmed pre-dementia or prodromal AD, and the mildest stage of AD dementia, that's been the population studied with aducanumab. Two large phase three trials were launched of aducanumab in early AD. And here's where the story gets very complicated and I'm gonna just say it quickly. Um, an interim analysis is a look at study data before the study is over. It's a way of giving up when things are hopeless in, a, in clinical development to save time and money. Um, and sometimes it's a way of stopping early to declare success. Well, interim analysis of the two huge international phase three trials of, adican trials of aducanumab led to the decision that the treatment was not working and it was stopped for futility. There are a number of reasons why that decision uh, came about and maybe we'll, we'll discuss that uh, uh, later. But after the futility analysis led to a halt of treatment, additional data was collected and the first of the large phase three trials was actually declared positive. The pre-specified analysis showed that the antibody did eliminate amyloid and slowed clinical progression of disease. And while the second large trial was negative, there was supportive data in the second trial, specifically the highest exposure to the antibody also showed clear benefit in the second trial. And as a result, despite declaring futility, the company, Biogen, submitted the data to the FDA and the FDA agreed to consider it. And the FDA has just announced after formal submission of the data in July that a decision will be made whether to approve aducanumab for clinical use in March 2021. So what does this mean for the field? Well, first, obviously, this is the closest we've gotten. So we've been at this for 30 years, and now we are potentially just months away from the first disease-modifying therapy. Now, I will say that the results are complicated because of the studies being stopped for futility. I will also say that the benefits, which I believe are clear, are modest. Uh, just a 20 or 22% slowing of disease progression. But I think that the important lessons from the aducanumab story are that targeting amyloid can be effective and we can do better than the aducanumab results submitted so far because the concept of early AD, while a big advance from AD dementia, is still relatively late in the overall continuum of disease. And if we want a benefit that is substantial and much greater than 20%, we need to intervene earlier still than so-called earlier a early AD. And in fact, we now know how to do that. Now, where do blood tests fit in? So I've talked about amyloid PET scans and tau PET scans as allowing us to visualize the abnormalities in the Alzheimer's disease brain. And they have been major breakthroughs that have cleared the way to understanding the full spectrum of disease and conducting powerful clinical trials. 
The problem is that PET scans are very expensive. They are not universally available. They involve exposure to radiation. They are not easy tools to implement. And this has uh, slowed us down. The huge additional advance in just the last couple of years is that we now have powerful blood tests that can essentially give us the information of PET scans with a simple, cost-effective blood test. We now have blood tests both to demonstrate amyloid accumulation in brain and to demonstrate progression of disease across the entire Alzheimer's disease spectrum. The amyloid test is called a, an A-beta peptide ratio, and it's the best version of that uses a procedure called mass spectrometry. And the test of where we are on the spectrum, the best example is PTAU217, phosphatau217, and that is a simple, uh, low-cost immunoassay. And together, they appear to give us just as much information as amyloid PET and tau PET, and they enable us to universally identify the disease and track its progression. Now, these are new tests. They are still being validated, but they are already being integrated into our trials, and they are changing the outlook for AD treatment and prevention. Now, I mentioned that I think that the benefit that we've seen with the phase three trials of aducanumab is modest, but we now know how to conduct our trials much earlier than so-called early AD. And that means the stage that we now call preclinical AD or asymptomatic AD. That describes people who have elevated amyloid in brain but have no symptoms, have not sought medical help. They clinically appear normal, but they actually have the disease at its latent phase. That's when we need to remove the amyloid. If we wait for symptoms, we wait it until there is extensive irreversible damage and the benefits of treatments that remove amyloid are only gonna be modest. If we go back to this uh, diagram of the disease, historically, our trials have been conducted when clinical function is declining. That's at the end stage at AD dementia. The aducanumab story is in prodromal AD and mild AD dementia, still to the right of this graph. But if we want to attack the disease while the brain is still functional, functioning normally, that's at the so-called preclinical AD stage, and that's what we are doing now. We are taking the most effective candidate treatments, and we are administering them to people who are on the Alzheimer's disease spectrum, but still at an early stage when we should be able to stop the irreversible damage and have a major impact on the clinical course of disease. I'm going to mention two of these studies. The first one that was launched is called A4, which stands for anti-amyloid treatment in asymptomatic Alzheimer's. It uses an anti-amyloid antibody, but an anti-monomer type. And I will say that targets the smallest type of amyloid. It doesn't remove amyloid plaques, but it slows their progression. This trial was launched a number of years ago. It's now fully enrolled and will be completed in the next uh, two and a half years. And we are very excited to be bringing this first uh, international study of uh, anti-amyloid treatment at this very early stage uh, to completion. The next one that I'll mention, it's called AHEAD345. This was just launched in July. And the difference between A4 and AHEAD345 is that the AHEAD study uses an amyloid reducing antibody, one like aducanumab, it's called Bantu 401, and it removes amyloid, it normalizes amyloid in brain. And it also extends our definition of preclinical AD to even a lower level of amyloid. Both of these trials are enormous public-private partnerships. They're jointly funded by NIH through the Alzheimer's Clinical Trials Consortium and industry, Lilly and ASI, the makers of uh, the 
the antibodies for A4 and a HED345. And both of these trials have been designed and are led uh, by uh, the USC Alzheimer's Therapeutic Research Institute. There are many challenges. I, I know I'm just out of time already. I'll just mention them here without discussing them. Uh, recruitment is a huge new challenge because we're enrolling people who have no symptoms. Measuring treatment effect at this early stage is challenging, but we have a great uh, cognitive tool for doing this and many secondary and biomarker outcomes to make these trials very powerful. And they are long studies, and that's why it's taken us so long to complete A4 and why it will still be another seven years before we complete the AHEAD program. The last thing that I'll mention is that these blood tests have not only strengthened these trials, but they've also given us a path towards primary prevention. And we can now measure changes in amyloid regulation before there's any accumulation in brain. And we have candidate therapeutics that can normalize the amyloid regulation in midlife. And this is a path to the primary prevention of AD, and we are very excited about that as well. So let me just stop by saying uh, these are tremendously ex exciting times. We are close to major breakthroughs, and I want to thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Paul. Um, this is Dana Goldman. Uh, I'm the director of the Schaefer Center, and we're very pleased uh, to be able to bring you this event that's joint with the Brookings Institution and USC, and it's as a result of the Schaefer Initiative, so we're very grateful to Leonard Schaefer for his support. Um, Paul, that was a fascinating presentation, and it's a good jumping off point for us to speak about the clinical promise here and the pitfalls. And to do that, I want to introduce Sharon Cohen, who's the director of the Toronto Memory Program and assistant professor in the Division of Neurology at the University of Toronto, and also Heather Snyder, who's vice president of medical and scientific relations at the Alzheimer's Association. So thank you both for joining us. And Sharon, I'd like to begin, Paul talked a lot about some promising technological innovations in diagnostics that will help advance where we're going both uh, clinically um, as well as in terms of innovation. But there are, uh, part of this event is to talk about barriers to access. And I wonder if you could speak a little bit about the barriers to diagnosis that you see uh, on the front lines as you're dealing with patients. Absolutely, Dana. Nice to join everyone today. Um, I think we should say first off, that we are doing poorly currently in terms of diagnosing Alzheimer's disease, even when the disease is advanced and fairly easy to diagnose. And there are three main reasons for that, which I'll mention briefly. And then the challenge becomes even more um, uh, interesting when we try to go earlier in the disease where there may be very subtle or mild symptoms or no symptoms at all. So in, in terms of why we're doing so badly now, even with somebody with straightforward dementia stage Alzheimer's disease is number one, patients themselves may not be insightful and may not complain. If we're talking about a disease like migraine, you've got headache, you go to the doctor. With Alzheimer's, you're losing your memory. You may not realize this or think there's anything wrong and that can be part of the disease itself, the lack of insight that goes with the disease. The second factor is that Patients and family and community don't mm -hmm. always appreciate that there are differences between normal aging and subtle benign forgetfulness and early forgetfulness due to Alzheimer's disease. So people tend to say, oh, well, you know, I've had a senior moment, I'm forgetful. Isn't that just part of aging and downplay this? Whereas on the prevention front, we would say, no, let's take mild memory symptoms seriously and dig a bit deeper. And then we come to our wonderful physician colleagues who do their best in the trenches, but this is not a disease that is diagnosed rapidly and for which there is an easy conversation about diagnosis with patient and family and for which there's an obvious treatment to reach for in on your prescription pad or toolkit. 
So most physicians would say they don't actually have the skill and resources to diagnose Alzheimer's disease, even if it's right in front of them, and they tend to shy away from dealing with this disease. Okay, now we're moving into a, a patient population with early symptoms, mild cognitive impairment. They don't tend to complain to their doctors. They may have their frustrations about memory just not working as well, but they're still functioning and in the community. And they get taken even less seriously if they do complain because there's not a lot to find unless you do very sensitive testing. Uh, and what about those folks without any symptoms who, as Paul Azen said, are already brewing the brain changes, the amyloid changes, they may not know unless they've got a family history or some other risk factor. So then if, if we dig deeper in terms of diagnosis, absolutely, as Paul said, we now have better tools. We don't just have to do cognitive testing, which has a lot of um, vagaries associated with it and may not be sensitive for mild stages of disease. We can do tests that don't just rule out other diseases, for example, CAT scans and MRIs to rule out tumors or strokes. We can do amyloid tests, PET scans, and uh, spinal fluid uh, examination to actually find if amyloid's accumulating and to make the diagnosis. But do we have these available to the majority of physicians and patients? No. Paul mentioned the cost. There's also the availability, even if I had infinite funds and said I want an amyloid test, I may not live in an area where somebody will easily, you know, have a lab or a cyclotron and PET scanner with the ligand that will allow me to have the test. And once we have a breakthrough in treatment, the demand for scalability of these very, very important biomarker tests will be enormous and we need to figure that out. Thank you, Sharon. So now I want to turn to Heather. Um, the Alzheimer's Association has been on the front lines of dealing with this epidemic. And as Paul pointed out, we've had some failures. Where do you see promise in clinical innovation that's actually going to have a meaningful impact for the patients and their caregivers? Yeah, well, first, thank you so much for including us on today's discussion and to all of those that uh, that are tuning in today or are watching uh, the video once it's made available. Uh, you know, I think there's probably three different things that I would talk about in, in looking at innovation. And Paul talked about, uh, in particular, I think, the and, and, and Sharon as well, the diagnostics, some of the tools that are emerging. And in particular, in, in clinical trials, I think, are where we're going to see the utilization, the use of some of these emerging markers. Um, in detecting the biology that might be changed in an individual. And in particular, is, is the biology changed in an individual that we're looking at targeting with a potential therapy? And, and we'll, you know, identifying the participants for the trials and, uh, and enrolling them accordingly. And, and so I think we're gonna see the emergence of those tools really into clinical trials. Some are already happening and, and even at greater speed going forward. So the addition of biomarkers and the addition of those tools and looking across that entire continuum that Paul talked about as well. And in that same vein, and, and Paul mentioned a couple of the ongoing studies, uh, the, the AHEAD trial and the A345, and there's some of the examples, but there are others such as uh, what's happening with the DINTU and, and different uh, other trial designs that are really pulling a page from what we've seen work in the cancer space or in the cardiovascular space and trying to apply into the Alzheimer's uh, and related dementia space in terms of, can we be more efficient with our trials? Can we do, uh, can we do a study, for instance, in a, in a population of individuals that we know will develop the disease, individuals that have the very rare mutations? Uh, and can we, can we see a signal with the biomarkers? And then if so, do we see an impact on the cognition, on the memory, thinking, and reasoning in those individuals? And so looking at some of those examples and those type, types of trial designs. But then the third area that I, I think we've, we've, Paul touched on, on, I think in passing, but really is what we've seen in the last five or six years has been a tremendous diversity of the clinical pipeline. So one of the things that the Alzheimer's Association we have is the Alzheimer's Association International Conference or AAIC. It's the largest convening of dementia science in the world. Typically, we have around 6,000 scientists that get together at this annual meeting. This past year, it was a little bit bigger in a virtual space at 33,000. But one of the things that we see through this meeting every year is really what's changing and what's the landscape in terms of what's moving into clinical trials, what's our, where is our understanding of the basic science that then is making that translation 
from the bench, from an idea into an early phase clinical trial. And we've just seen a tremendous diversity of that pipeline growing. Through our own funding, we have a program called Part the Cloud, which is really aimed at those phase one, phase two trials. And just about, I think last week, we announced uh, over 16 new trials that are moving forward, uh, really looking at how the brains are producing energy and can we target some of those mechanisms in, in the biology that we know goes wrong in Alzheimer's. The immune system, how the immune system and the inflammation uh, response that we see again throughout the trajectory of Alzheimer's, uh, and, and can we target that as a potential therapy. Looking at the vasculature, so we know there's this really important link to uh, our cerebrovascular system, so blood flow and the blood vessels in our brain, and uh, uh, perhaps uh, being associated with some of the other brain changes we see in Alzheimer's. Can we target some of that biology even earlier? And what does that do in terms of potential therapies? So seeing that diversity in terms of the pipeline, I think is also one of the really exciting things for me personally, and, and I think in the field in general, as we understand more and more about this biology, our brains are really complicated. Alzheimer's is a complex disease and the need to really be able to target multiple biologies and individuals as we go forward. The idea of combination therapy, whether it be with multiple drugs or lifestyle interventions as well, very similar to how we treat and think about heart disease today. So I think all of that together is we're not where any of us want to be, particularly, you know, in the United States, there's more than 5 million Americans that are living with Alzheimer's today, more than 16 million people providing care and support. And that's even greater when you go globally. We're not where we need to be in terms of having a way to stop or slow, but the progress that we're making, I think Paul said, we've learned a lot. And we're not only, we've not only learned a lot, but we're applying that to our trial design, to, uh, to looking at the complexity of the biology, how can we target it, and how can we accelerate that progress forward? Thank you, Heather. And I think both you and Paul spoke quite promisingly about the arc of innovation here. And I think back a few years ago, Actually, I'll think back to the experience of cancer where we didn't make a lot of progress for many years and then our understanding of the basic biology improved and we've had a wave of innovation on immuno-oncology. Is it your belief that we're at an inflection point and maybe what's coming up with aducanumab becoming the first effective treatment coming on the market, that that will spur more innovation here or are we just uh, kind of plodding along? I'll give that to Paul or Heather and Sharon. Anyone raise sure, your I'll, hand? I'll, I'll jump in. I think, Dana, we're absolutely at an inflection point. There's no turning back. You know, the amyloid hypothesis has been debated uh, for a long time. And now I, I think, you know, it, it's very clear that amyloid is a bad actor and you need to target early and maybe certain um, types of amyloid uh, preferentially over others. And that, as Heather said, in a complex disease, it's going to take more than amyloid to stop this disease. But if we have the first amyloid disease modifying treatment on the market, this is a huge foothold because then we can add to that other combinations and anti-tau or anti-inflammatory other things that will build just the way you aptly described the analogy with cancer, cancer chemotherapy. If you understand the components, how to measure them, and can have a cocktail of therapies that target different uh, aspects of the cancer, or in this case, Alzheimer's, at different stages when they're needed. Yeah, there's no turning back from this. We're not going to go to the dark days. We need to find the platform and, and the system reorganization that allows us to move forward with the biomarkers we have, the understanding we have, and keep building. Yeah, I, I think the one thing, Dana, that I'd add is, and again, I think building off of, of learnings from what we've seen in cancer and cardiovascular disease is when you have the tools to identify the biology at the earliest time point as well, that allows you to intervene at that earlier time point and identify who's going to maybe benefit from a particular treatment and you have better outcomes. So some of the, the what Sharon talked a lot about in terms of the diagnostics and Paul talked as well about, I think those are, we can't think of them as separate trains. They both need to continue forward at full speed because both are absolutely essential as we move forward. Um. You know, Dana, I just want to acknowledge how terrific this panel is. I think that one of the reasons that we are at an inflection point and we are going to see success soon is the effectiveness of our collaboration. And I want to highlight that the way we make progress and the way we're going to get to success is by working together effectively. 
And it's a large team. And it's great to have Sharon on the team here on the panel. Sharon is a, an outstanding uh, clinical trialist. And her team in Toronto has been among the most successful sites for recruitment into the most challenging trials. And so it's been uh, great to, to work with her on these studies and to share the panel with her. And the Alzheimer's Association, I think, uh, has led the effort to collaborate effectively uh, more than any other group. Um, they've also been terrific funders, not only the part of the cloud that Heather spoke about, but the Alzheimer's Association also co-funds our uh, A4 program, and we work very closely with the association, and the association brings the world investigators together at uh, AAIC, but also through encouraging worldwide implementation of various tools and designs like ADNI and LEADS, and, and that has brought together the entire community. And I think when we all work together and also include policy experts like Leonard Schaefer and Dana Goldman, I think this is the way that we make progress. And I believe that our field, Alzheimer's disease therapeutics, is better at scientific collaboration than any other field. And by continuing to work together and sharing everything that we learn and talking together about the best steps uh, to continue to advance, that's how we make progress. We are on the cusp now of, of a major advance. We may have an approved drug in a few months. As Heather says, that's the beginning, not the end. We need to move our treatments earlier. We need to get to primary prevention. We need to target not only amyloid, but tau and tangles and inflammation, microglial cells and genetics, APOE. And there are many great targets. And by working together uh, towards all of these uh, aspects of controlling this disease, uh, we are going to be effective soon and we are going to be extremely effective in controlling this this epidemic. Thank you, all three of you. So uh, just to, or, or to orient, I have two more questions uh, for the panel, and then I will open it up for a Q&A. We're getting some questions there. Feel free to submit them, and I've already kind of addressed some of them. But my two questions, I want to first start with Paul. You showed a continuum of the disease, and that's a very compelling diagram. And then Sharon spoke about what the clinical manifestations of that are and what it means for the patient. But one thing I didn't see is the number of patients. And is this a funnel? So for example, I have been forgetting, I'm in my mid fifties without getting into too much detail. I've been forgetting my words lately. Is it inevitable that I'm gonna end up at early AD and, and these new treatments that are coming online like aducanumab, are they for everyone, so I should be going out and thinking about this, or is this a narrow population right now? So maybe I can start here. Uh, Dana, you don't have to go out and get out of Canamab now. <laughs> um, I think that uh, it is inevitable that you're going to have uh, changes in your memory and your language and your speed of processing. And this is what we call normal aging, normal cognitive aging. And it's usually noticeable by age 40 or 50. And pretty much all 50 year olds have noticed it. Um, and this is not part of Alzheimer's disease and it's not predictive of Alzheimer's disease. It's an inevitable aspect of aging. And the good news is that normal cognitive aging while very annoying does not interfere to any significant extent with function. So something to put up with um, but it is not a uh, condition that's associated with clinical decline. So On the Paul, other hand, just a, just a, just a, if you want to bill me for the telemedicine visit uh, <laughs> during the panel, that's fine. Okay. I will. Go Good. Ahead. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Um, so while cognitive aging is both uh, universal, inevitable, but not clinically so important, Alzheimer's disease is highly prevalent but not inevitable. Um, we, we usually talk, we, most people refer to the Alzheimer's Association for the figures, but I'm gonna 
uh, uh, give that give some of the figures from the Alzheimer's Association, which point to an estimate that we currently have about six million cases of Alzheimer's disease in the U.S. That's using the older definition of Alzheimer's dementia. If we expand the definition of Alzheimer's to include pre-dementia individuals with mild symptoms and even individuals with no symptoms, so if we want a, an inclusive definition of the entire AD continuum, then we have to at least triple the number. So it's 20 million or more individuals who already have the brain changes of Alzheimer's disease. And if we think in terms of proportion of the population, if we look at the entire population over the age of 65, 30% have Alzheimer's disease pathology. So it's an enormous problem, but it is not inevitable. And people can live to be 105 without Alzheimer's disease. And as we become more effective in controlling uh, lifestyle risk factors, and especially as we start monitoring people using blood tests starting in midlife and control the abnormalities, just the way we use statins to control cholesterol, we're going to use secretase inhibitors perhaps to control amyloid dysregulation and actually have primary prevention that will dramatically reduce the scary numbers that I've just mentioned. But will the new treatments be, are we going to look at 30% of the elderly taking aducanumab? Taking or something, yes. Uh, everybody's going to be screened. They're going to be screened starting at age 50 or age 45. And a significant portion of the population will be on statin-type drugs. And everybody who actually enters the Alzheimer's spectrum with amyloid accumulation will be on therapies to get rid of that amyloid. And whether it's aducanumab or gantanerumab or Bantu 401 or denanumab or any of the candidate, terrific candidate therapeutics, which ones remain to be seen? But yes, this is going to change everything and it is gonna mean a lot of people on a new type of but therapy. But that primary Dana, prevents, yeah, go ahead. I was gonna say, I just think it is important to just note that at this point in time, this is still an ongoing process because I think there's been a couple of comments, like there is no approved therapeutic. It is an ongoing process. And we really look to the, the rigorous review of the FDA uh, as that process goes forward. So I do wanna just make sure we make that clarification point. Paul mm -hmm. talked about a lot of other candidates that are in the pipeline and, and they're all at other stages of that process. I so, see. And what's I, yes, sorry. go ahead, Sharon. If please. I could just um, uh, try to be clarifying a little bit. Um, uh, you know, if if aducanumab is approved uh, next winter, spring, that's great. We've got our first disease modifier. Even if it isn't, one will come. And are we ready for it? And who will be eligible? And just because we have a first disease modifier, aducanumab or otherwise, on the market doesn't mean that that particular drug is appropriate for the full spectrum of asymptomatic, preclinical, MCI, mild, moderate, severe Alzheimer's disease. So these numbers we're talking about, how many are in the funnel and who's eligible for a particular drug, it's not a given that the 30 million or the 30% of adults would be on aducanumab. And the label that the FDA or other health regulators gives to any disease modifier that comes to the market, let's say aducanumab in the spring, hopefully, uh, will be based on who was enrolled in the pivotal trials. Were they people with mild AD? How was that defined? And then how do you identify those people in the community? So we have, we have time. We need to be planning now how to organize our healthcare system and identify people properly but it's not as if everybody all at once is going to be on the first drug approved. I see, in fact, uh, our, I wanna ask about questions of access because some of the, you, you talked about diagnosis. I wanna talk about, and barriers to diagnosis. I'd like to ask everyone here about barriers to treatment. And then finally, I wanna, or in addition, because we're running out of time, I wanna talk about barriers to clinical trial enrollment because we know clinical trials are not uh, enrolling representative populations. Part of that has to do, I think, with access to 
academic medical centers and PET scans and the like, how are we going to ensure that the clinical trials are focused? And I want to put a plug in for the work of the Gates uh, Ventures uh, and that Bill Gates has supported to figure out how we can accelerate uh, the clinical pipeline here. And we have a paper on our at the Sh at the Schaefer Center that people can access from our website. But really, how are we going to ensure that the trials are representative of the populations that we want to treat? Heather, did you want to start? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's an incredibly important question. And as you know, uh, Dana, is something that uh, is, is certainly a priority of the Alzheimer's Association as we look at clinical trials and we look at uh, really ensuring that our, our community is represented, the full community is represented in clinical trials. You know, increasingly, and an example would be increasingly, uh, the data is suggesting that one of the risk genes, so this is a gene that's thought to increase your risk. We all get one copy from our mother, one copy from our father. And if you have one copy of this gene, ApoE, four, you're at a slightly increased risk. And if you have two copies, you're thought to be at a greater risk. But increasingly, the data is telling us that individuals from different racial and ethnic backgrounds may have differences in terms of the risk of ApoE4 and, and what it might contribute to their individual risk. And so as we think about uh, the potential of, of clinical trials that we're targeting or how we might be um, enrolling or identifying participants, we really need to also understand, kind of going back to the prior uh, discussion, we need to understand the basic biology and, and understand where might there be similarities and differences and, and really ensure that our trials are fully representative so that when there is a therapy, whether it be medication, whether it be lifestyle, whether it be combinations of those, we can be assured that it will also be reflective uh, and, and beneficial to all of the participants going forward. And, and that's where tools for um, diagnostics, for markers, for identifying the underlying biology and then looking at targeting and do you see a, a, do you see a uh, target engagement? And then do you see a benefit become incredibly important of, of making sure that those go hand in hand? I wanted to um, add that one barrier, and there are many, to clinical trial participation is the lack of understanding and buy-in from the community at large and our physician colleagues at large about uh, the value of clinical trials. We are not taking people and experimenting on them as if they are laboratory animals. We are running very carefully controlled and regulated studies within which individuals are pioneering with the scientific community to hopefully better themselves, but also their families' outcomes and people they don't even know. The altruism factor is huge. The invitation by a physician to say, would you consider participating in a trial is a huge opportunity that is missed all the time with physicians being a little paternalistic. I know that's a sexist term, but I don't know the, the generic term. Uh, and thinking, oh no, much too dangerous. Why would you bother a frail senior? You know, too expensive. You know, all kinds of myths about trials. We need to get rid of that just the way we do in cancer care much more successfully. If we have a diagnosis of cancer in somebody for whom there isn't a good cancer treatment, right away there's a pathway to join a clinical trial in the hope that they'll do better. We don't have that in Alzheimer's disease. And yes, we can talk about minority recruitment and all, of, all kinds of other things. But if we had a system reorganization that allowed people diagnosed with Alzheimer's to immediately have a way to access trials in their geography, we would do much better. Thank you. Um, finally, and this is related to some questions that are coming through, we tend to focus on clinical trials, but what about the possibility of lifestyle modification and environmental factors to deal with the course of the epidemic? Well, so I, I guess, oh, go ahead, go ahead, Paul. Sorry. We'll go Paul, then Heather. <clears throat> okay. Um, there, there are, we could think of uh, there being two major types of approach to controlling Alzheimer's disease. And one is to attack the biology of the disease and drugs like aducanumab attack the amyloid or attack the tau. And the other is to improve the brain's resistance, to improve resilience, to uh, 
allow the brain to withstand biological abnormalities. And it's in terms of resilience, I think, that lifestyle changes uh, can have a major impact. Um, evidence suggests, and it's not so easy to test this, but evidence suggests that there are a number of lifestyle approaches that can have a substantial impact on uh, Alzheimer's disease. Uh, staying uh, physically active, staying um, cognitively engaged uh, throughout life, staying socially connected, uh, controlling uh, diseases that could contribute that are related to lifestyle like cardiovascular and cerebrovascular disease and having a healthy diet. There is evidence behind each of these approaches. And while, uh, again, this is an area in which it's hard to do um, powerful clinical trials to prove the extent of the benefit. It only makes sense that our efforts should extend beyond the biological efforts to lifestyle efforts and both increase brain resilience and attack the disease. I think that's the best approach to making a big difference. Thank you. Heather? Yeah, so just I think building right off of Paul is is those studies that are doing that in a in a rigorous and large scale way are happening right now and and really building off of uh, some prior work that came out of Finland uh, under Dr. Mia Kivapelto and looking at combining lifestyle interventions in a very specific recipe, if you will, uh, and saw a benefit on cognition. Now, these were individuals that were thought to be at an increased risk. They did not have Alzheimer's. They did not have dementia. Uh, but we're now looking at replicating that here in the United States through the U.S. Pointer Trial, but also all around the world through uh, a global initiative called Worldwide Fingers, really linking these multi-component lifestyle interventions interventions that are taking the best information of science and in a rigorous way evaluating what is that potential impact on cognition with the idea of when we have that information and we have that answers, we'll be able to translate that to very specific recommendations, which we unfortunately don't have yet. Okay, we're running out of time. So Sharon, I'll give you one last word and then I'll wrap up. Oh, how kind of you. Uh, I'd like to say it's, it's a very hopeful time in Alzheimer's disease, despite all of the challenges, diagnostic challenges and, uh, you know, access challenges, costs of tracers and biomarkers. We, we are on the cusp of a breakthrough and we are looking forward to translating what's been going on in clinical trials for the last few decades into something meaningful for patients. So much more to come. And I hope people will, will continue to follow what's happening in this field, a terribly important disease. As Dr. Schaefer mentioned at the beginning, uh, you know, we can't ignore this disease. It's, it's toll on, on the economy and on, on patient and family well-being. So stay tuned, better things to come. Thank you. And I just want to point out, you know, if the, one of the lessons from HIV where we made remarkable progress uh, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, uh, one of the lessons there was new treatments came out, but there was, we restricted them for people who are in a narrow subset. And over time, we figured out how to expand it so we could really treat the disease chronically. And I think some of this optimism we've heard from the panel should be tempered by a notion that there may be a narrow clinical slice at first that these early treatments, but that our hope is that there'll be follow on innovation that will revolutionize the field. So Absolutely. thank you to all three of you. That was excellent. I wish we had more time and we may have to do it again. And now we're gonna uh, proceed. Our next speaker will be Darius Lakdawalla. He is the, um, I should know because I've been working with him for 20 years. He's the Quintiles Chair in Regulation and Innovation at the School of Pharmacy. And he's also um, director of research at the Schaefer Center. And he will give a presentation and that'll be followed by a panel. Thanks, Dana. And thanks so much for having me. I thoroughly enjoyed the first panel and it's an honor to, to follow that. Um, just to, to uh, capitalize on the great conversation from earlier, I think what we learned is that uh, it's quite likely that there will eventually be disease-modifying agents for Alzheimer's disease. Um, it's also quite likely that the early uh, agents we see might be narrowly targeted 
uh, but eventually we'll have treatments that are focused on preclinical, presymptomatic individuals, and that really motivates the work that we've been doing on how will we pay for that, uh, and in particular on how the that here is how will we pay for uh, treatments that are broad-based in preclinical stages of Alzheimer's. Um, it's not too early to begin asking that question because it's going to be a, a substantial um, economic problem, and we have to make sure the economics doesn't serve as a bottleneck to the amazing clinical breakthroughs that we're seeing. Let me begin with the, the acknowledgments and disclosures. Um, so I'm going to present very, very briefly a research project I've been working on with Jakob Lavka, Brian Tysinger, Jeff Yu, and, and Dana Goldman. Dana is, is my co-principal investigator on this project, which is funded by uh, the National Institute on Aging, and we're very grateful for their support here. Um, and here are my uh, disclosures. So I'm going to begin with a little bit of background uh, on the Alzheimer's pipeline, not too much because we've already heard uh, a terrific discussion about it, and then discuss uh, what, we, what we can figure out about the long-term health and cost consequences of novel disease-modifying therapies for Alzheimer's, and, and get to what we think is a principal economic challenge, is how do we think about how to pay for drugs that will have long-lasting consequences and effects uh, on patients, yet will likely require maybe broad-based use in the future and therefore um, significant budgetary challenges. Alzheimer's has been a disease that's been resistant to progress for a long time, but as we've heard, there are many, many reasons for optimism. Um, as of last year, here's a, here's a study that was done on the Alzheimer's pipeline. You can see that uh, over half of the 130 some odd drugs in the pipeline are disease modifying therapies, uh, which I, I think is, is emblematic of the, of the hope and progress that uh, our panelists were discussing earlier. Um, this also though raises a number of important questions about how we're going to uh, pay for these technologies. And also I think maybe looking a little bit longer term, how we pay for these technologies governs how we incentivize new innovation. Because if we're unable to properly uh, reimburse uh, new technologies, we will necessarily be unable to stimulate the introduction of future innovations as well. Now, the early drugs, as we've heard, um, and ad aducanumab is a good example, there are probably going to be more narrowly focused. So ad aducanumab expects to be targeted, uh, present at least, primarily in elderly patients who are post-symptomatic. Uh, but the presumption we have, and I think is consistent with the discussion from the earlier panel, is that if these early, early treatments are, or rather initial stage treatments are uh, successful, follow-on treatments might arrive that will target younger preclinical presymptomatic patients before the disease has progressed and before severity has mounted. So the shift towards a treating both a younger population and a bigger population will pose particular challenges. For one, one thing is that um, in earlier stage treatment or preclinical pre treatment, private payers will be bearing more of the cost, yet a lot of the benefit will accrue downstream uh, to Medicare in our current uh, reimbursement system, particularly if the benefits of early stage treatment are durable. So in that setting, we have a classic misaligned incentive problem. Private payers are bearing the cost, uh, but not necessarily deriving uh, the benefit. So what we wanted to know was, to what extent are benefits and costs misaligned, and how can we address that problem? In order to analyze this, we use something uh, that we've developed at the Schaefer Center. In fact, Dana developed uh, many years ago when he was at the Rand Corporation and brought it over to USC, um, called the Future Elderly Model, which as the name suggests, is designed to project the long-term health consequences um, of various interventions. Um, it's also elderly maybe as a misnomer because it's really for Americans over the age of 50. Um, uh, if Dana had to, I suppose, name the model today, he might choose a different name given uh, the, the, his current demographic uh, characterization. Um, but what we do is use the FEM to forecast the effects of um, uh, interventions 
on um, functional and cognitive status for uh, Americans in this age group. And we look at some, what we think of as plausible scenarios of disease modifying therapies. And actually we're quite conservative. We use modest treatment benefit scenarios. I think what Paul would characterize as modest benefit scenarios and think about how we could pay for these. Here's, here's just a very simple piece of data. If you look at, at average trends in cognition, this is not for patients with dementia or Alzheimer's disease. This is just average trends in cognition for a representative sample of Americans age 50. And this, I think, was the discussion that uh, Paul brought up earlier, that cognitive, cognitive decline is a normal part of aging. You can see that here, that this is something called the telephone interview for cognitive status, which measures people's cognitive function. And you can see that uh, by the time people hit sort of their mid 80s, the average American is exhibiting signs consistent with mild cognitive impairment. That's this red line here. Um, they never quite get to dementia, even at age 100, which is good news. But you can see this slow decline. This is normal. Um, healthy cognition. There are some Alzheimer's patients within here, uh, but there is a, a rate of decline that is anticipated. Um, but what we're interested in is what happens when you look at patients who are suffering from Alzheimer's disease and have much more rapid decline. And we looked, uh, I'll shortcut a, a number of details here, but uh, just to say that we looked at two different kinds of scenarios. One is um, a scenario in which a new therapy slows cognitive decline, slows the rate of cognitive decline by 20%. I think actually Paul explicitly called that a modest um, gain associated with uh, disease modifying um, agents. And again, this is I think a relatively conservative analysis given where we are today and there's a lot of uncertainty about when these treatments will arrive. And also we're assuming we only treat patients with some symptoms, mild cognitive impairment, um, over the age of 50. Then alternatively, we look at a scenario where we slow functional decline uh, by 20%. Um, so these are slightly different in terms of the dimensions of health that are being improved, but otherwise they're meant to be representative of relatively early stage usage of, um, or early generations of disease modifying agents. The total health burden of Alzheimer's is considerable. And, and here, all we're doing is just showing you the direct health impact of Alzheimer's disease. This doesn't include caregiver burden, health costs, any of those other uh, kinds of costs. This is just the direct burden on the patient measured as in terms of quality adjusted life years lost. And uh, just to give you a sense of what this means and for context, if you look at say an early 50 year old who's experiencing symptoms of mild cognitive impairment, that individual can expect to lose about 2.8 quality adjusted life years. Typically in the US, we think a quality adjusted life years worth somewhere between 100 or $200,000, maybe 100, $150,000. Let's take 150, which means that this health burden for the early 50 year old is worth around $420,000. When you get into the mid 50s, there's life expectancy is shorter, so necessarily the burden shrinks a little bit. That's about $375,000 and so forth. And this is just a fraction of uh, the burden imposed by the disease. So this is a costly disease. This burden estimate also, um, should be, it should be noted, uh, most of the, uh, of the gains associated with slowing decline accrue um, after the age of 65, after people become Medicare eligible. So look even at people who are in their early to mid or late 50s, and you can see that well over half of the gains of treatment, oops, that is administered at the age of 50, just to be clear, and paid for upfront by private payers, most of those gains are flowing to Medicare, even among the 50, the 50 year old. So this, this creates, uh, this, this is evidence of this kind of misaligned incentive problem um, where private payers are gonna be asked to pick up the tab, uh, but they're not going to uh, be covering the patient for um, much of the benefit accrual. And of course, this problem is made even worse by turnover of, uh, of, of um, private insured enrollees from one company to the next. This doesn't even uh, consider that issue. It's just uh, the burden sharing between private payers and Medicare. 
Um, so the question we asked is, could this kind of incentive problem be mitigated with alternative payment designs? So traditionally, drugs are paid for when they're used. This is kind of the old style of paying for drugs. And the problem is if the benefits of a drug that's taken over a short period of time uh, accrue over a long term, this creates this misalignment problem. But there have been other alternatives proposed. One is something called a drug mortgage or a constant installment payment, where we, you spread out payment over the lifetime of an individual. A twist on that is that uh, in addition to spreading out the payment, you also prorate it according to when benefits accrue. The good news is that the FDA has, it's not the FDA, the CMS has taken important steps recently to eliminate some of the regulatory barriers that stand in the way or have stood in the way of these kinds of novel payment mechanisms. Um, I won't go in deep into the weeds here, but uh, the key point is that previously, because of Medicaid rules, if, uh, if a manufacturer had a contract um, that involved a, a very steep discount, let's say a zero payment for a drug that didn't work on a particular person, that zero price would become Medicaid's price for every Medicaid beneficiary. And that was a huge deterrent to uh, novel pricing that linked uh, pricing to performance. CMS has now addressed this by saying, we're not gonna hold you to every single individual price paid, but we're just gonna take an average price and treat that as the Medicaid price. So that's important progress and it's, um, related to recommendations that uh, we've made over the past several years in published research. So here's a, just a very simple uh, illustration of how this could help. Assume that a therapy is priced to extract about a fifth of the discounted quality gain, which is based on earlier research on drug pricing, and then calculate the monetized gain, quality gain to payers netting out medical costs. And you can see here that a, a couple things. If we just stuck with traditional upfront payment, private payers would probably be uh, bearing more costs than benefit um, for most of the uh, patients that they're uh, paying for. Uh, however, if you switch to drug mortgages or constant installments, you solve most of the problem. There's maybe still a little bit of an issue um, for patients in their early 60s. And if you then added a pay for performance element, you could completely eliminate this misaligned incentive problem. Um, so I'll close with some, some implications that as future generations of uh, Alzheimer's treatments come online that move towards treating earlier stage younger patients, these incentive problems will become more severe. We've seen similar kinds of problems, for instance, with hepatitis C treatment. Um, and it's important to figure out how to make sure private payers are getting what they pay for and are not paying uh, more than their fair share. And in this case, since, qual since most of the clinical benefits are accruing to Medicare, we've got to figure out how to normalize the burden of costs. Um, constant installment or drug mortgage payments can help mitigate this. Pay for performance can do even better. And the good news is that regulatory changes in recent uh, months even um, can help us move forward towards these novel payment plans. We do have time to figure this out because uh, it's gonna take time for, for new therapies to come online that treat younger people in pre-symptomatic stages, but it's not too early because there are significant uh, barriers to implementing these kinds of novel reimbursement mechanisms. Um, I'll stop there and I really look forward to the discussion with my distinguished panelists. Thank you, Darius. As usual, a very clear elucidation of the incentives inherent in this kind of treatment. Uh, so I thank you for that, um, as do all the others. So now I'd like to have a discussion with our panelists about policies to support access. We're going to bring in Steve Miller, who has been on the front lines of these discussions for many years. He's the chief clinical officer at Cigna Corporation. And Sarah Locke, who's the senior vice president for policy and brain health, policy research and international affairs division. So a lot of responsibilities at AARP. Um, and I'd like to start, Steve, uh, Darius always does an excellent job with the incentives. Uh, you face this issue with hepatitis C, actually. And in some ways, uh, uh, Darius did some work that showed that all the benefits of treating hep C would accrue to the Medicare program, but you covered hep C. So could you talk about 
the extent to which this concern that the benefits will accrue downstream affects private payers? Yeah, thanks, Dana, for having me, and to Leonard, uh, to really, uh, you know, appreciate all the work that the Schaefer Center has been doing. And so it's a pleasure to be with you all today. And these problems are not new, as you point out. There's other examples where we pay for things uh, that we don't see the benefit from on the commercial side. Uh, number one is doing the right thing for patients has to be the goal. And so we as a society will not be successful if we're not doing the right thing for patients. And what Darius points out, which I think he did really eloquently, is that we're going to have to be as innovative in payments as the scientists are being in the drugs they develop. And so it doesn't matter if we're talking about gene therapies or treatments for Alzheimer's or treatment for cancer. For many of these things, the old model of how we pay for things is not going to be sustainable. And so I love the work he's doing because it's really pushing us to say, what innovations can we have to treat, to pay for drugs? And as you know, Dana, because you all led much of the work, there's been much innovation that occurred even around hepatitis C. We see the states doing the Netflix model where they're buying up drug essentially so they could use as much as they need. It incents them to actually find patients with hepatitis. Now, that did not work out in Louisiana. They were never able to get quite all the way there, and they had to modify the plan. But the point is, we're all innovating. I'll give you another example. When it comes to gene therapies, we have set up a system called Embark, where there is actually no copay for the patient. Because the reality is, there's no role for a copay for patients when they get gene therapy. And so we're going to have to really be creative when it comes to Alzheimer's, not just in the near future for the fairly large population that will want the drugs, but especially, as Darius points out, as we move to the asymptomatic phase and that population grows exponentially. Great. Thank you, Steve. And we're going to come to some of those issues about the size of the population and how we would be innovative on pricing in a second. But first, I want to turn to Sarah. And Sarah, a lot of our work has said that the playing field is really tilted against prevention. Uh, you know, for example, you know, if I figure out a way to get every uh, elderly person to exercise, I don't get a patent on that. But if I find a drug that does that, I can. So, you know, what policy changes do we need so that we can do a better job here identifying the patients who might benefit? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Dana, for that question. And I have to say, I also appreciate being part of this terrific panel and a lot of the inspiring conversation about innovations. It is a very exciting time, but they're innovations with prevention. Uh, first off. And I think we have to start changing the conversation in healthcare systems right now, not only for the new diagnostics and therapies that are going to be coming soon, hopefully, but to engage people with conversations about what reducing risk for cognitive decline and dementia can do now. You know, the numbers we're talking about are staggering. 290 billion spent in 2019 in healthcare. Evidence is pointing uh, to the fact that we can reduce the risk for people with cognitive decline 20 to 40% of those who are facing it. And if we could change the model of uh, healthcare to reduce those risks, and Paul mentioned many of them, but around diabetes, around uh, heart conditions. What's good for the heart is good for the brain. If we could actually implement that in the system and we could reduce by half the numbers of people who would develop dementia, and we think that we can delay it up to about five years, we could cut incidents in half. It's really a phenomenal. So just simply delaying onset of cognitive decline and dementia could reduce the burden by half. We really have to get information to healthcare providers and to, into healthcare systems to show the effective interventions. And the same kinds of interventions of 
increasing exercise, appropriate diets, reducing risks for comorbidities that often occur with dementia, we would actually be able to improve the quality of life for people living with dementia now. And you know, all of these therapies, even if the FDA does approve it in March of 2021 of the latest uh, medication, it's still going to be years before we can get it into the system and get people treated so that they can see an outcome that is beneficial. So we have thousands, millions of people in the system right now, and we have to innovate care to improve care and services and change payment models so that we know we can get the evidence-based interventions to the people who need them now, both from a risk reduction point of view and an improving care point of view. Yes, that's very important. So all of this has pointed to a dramatic unmet need. On the other hand, clinically, there's going to be a, a label on this. So I want to send it, point, put this to the entire panel, but uh, first I'll address it to Steve. There's going to be a narrow label at first on the, the treatments that come out, and I think aducanumab would be a good example there. And I remember when the PCSK9s first were being developed. That was an incremental improvement over statins in a very highly um, high need area, despite the presence of statins. And the first estimate said we we're going to spend a hundred billion on them potentially. Um, I just wonder, and it ended up being somewhere between one or two billion, I think, uh, uh, currently. I just wonder, Steve, have you done a market size calculation for any of these pipeline products and have a sense for where we're going to be when they come out? Yeah, so Dana, you bring up a really important point, and that is what's going to be the FDA label. And then remember, payers are not actually obligated to the FDA label. Some payers actually will say, we're only going to cover those who actually were in the study. So if the FDA gives a broader label than the study design, not all payers will actually adhere to that. And remember that all payers includes Medicare. So, you know, how they actually determine, the national coverage determination will determine how even Medicare reimburses for it. And they're not obligated just to the guidelines of the label uh, made by Medicare. And so when we look at the, the funnel, you could start really large, right? So we have over 55 million people over the age of 65, and almost every one of them would want it if they thought this was a preventative therapy. You then get down to what we were talking about earlier, where you have 6 million people with diagnosed Alzheimer's, you have over another almost 15 million people with some prodrome to it, and so you're talking about that 20 million number. Uh, looking at the study design, if you go strictly by the Biogen study design, that's about one and a half million people. So you can see that funnel, depending on what the label looks like, you could actually have as small, which is still a large population, as 1.5 million, or you could have many, many more million in there. And the other thing is remember that patient demand for the product is going to be different than just who will pay for it. There's gonna be a lot of wealthy people that will say, I won't use my insurance. I'm willing to actually pay for this with cash out of pocket. My big concern also is because under current, if you think about, about 75 to 80% of the patients are gonna be on a government program. The way the government programs are set up, especially Medicare Part B is in boy, the out-of-pocket expense for this drug is actually going to make it very difficult for the average patient to access this. So if you think about the average out-of-pocket for a MAB, for a monoclonal antibody, is going to be about $5,000 per year. The vast majority of patients with Alzheimer's don't have $5,000 to pay for this. So we really are going to need some innovation and different approaches for this. Would one, and I'll, I'll address this to all, the whole panel. Would one option here be to say that we are going to stick to the label, which will probably be narrow, would be my guess. And typically, Part B, they cover everything off-label. But would one approach here to be to say we're only going to reimburse for on-label use, but we're going to waive the copay? 
uh, Darius is that, or I'll, Steve, go ahead. Yeah. And then Darius and Sarah. Yeah. Well, I want to throw in one other complication. Remember that getting diagnosed for this uh, narrow label will probably require a tau PET CT that, or an amyloid PET CT. So you're adding another really expensive procedure on top of this. And so the complexity is pretty great. It's also weight based. And so if they make the drug, uh, if they price it based on weight, there is actually a period of time where you actually increase the dose over the course of the first six months. That actually, the first year you'll have less drug expense, but more diagnostic expense, and then the ongoing expense will be the drug. And I actually think, to your point, we're going to have to come up with novel ways of what to do about that copay if we're going to not keep this from being just a rich person's drug. That's good. Uh, Darius, did you want to comment on that? Because you had done some work early on that said we shouldn't be pricing a Vastin, uh, for example, by the quantity we use. And that ended up with all the issues when it was went from cancer to macular degeneration. So you've been a proponent of value for a long time, pricing yeah, value. I, I th thanks, Dana. And I think Steve makes a ton of terrific points here. Um, I would say that there are two issues to decouple. One is who should get the therapy, and that's a clinical question, who benefits from it. And the second thing is what do we pay for each kind of patient getting the therapy? It's, it, to me, it doesn't make a lot of sense to solve affordability by uh, narrowing um, clinical uh, criteria unless that's truly what's clinically beneficial. The problem here is we need more flexibility in our payment models. And I also agree that saddling patients with out-of-pocket expenses makes no sense, and saddling private payers with uh, more than their benefit than they're getting makes no sense. So I think we got to start with who's going to clinically benefit, and then figure out how to pay for that value. Yeah, I would just talk about what is the clinical value of this medication, and how will it work? Um, if it's not going to be changing outcomes that matter to individuals, if it's not going to be actually improving their life or their quality of life, and instead what we have is reduction in amyloid, um, we really need to make sure that clinicians and patients and their families see the benefits of these medications if it's going to be widely used, especially as Steve described, the, ex the extreme amount of cost associated with determining whether it's necessary and useful. Yeah, and actually, Darius, this gets, that's a fantastic point, Sarah, and also uh, this question is for the entire panel. We've published a lot in our work that one advantage is the downstream benefits and innovation, but we know people are facing very burdensome costs now. How do we allocate that, those future benefits, and should we reward early innovators if their product is only moving the needle a little bit. I'm gonna yeah, open think, that, Darius, go Well, ahead. just quickly, um, I, I think that's, that's right. The, I mean, fundamentally, people, the innovators should get paid for value. Um, and that is the best way to align incentives. And if you have a regime where you're just clearly saying, if you have a valuable innovation, you're gonna get paid for it, that stimulates the right kind of innovation. I do think it, it's just worth pointing out we do have a little bit of time to figure this out. I, Steve's, I think Steve's calculation is also something I've seen. It's about a million and a half people for aducanumab, but the vast majority are on Medicare. So we do have some time to figure out this, this private payment issue, uh, but it's not too early to begin solving it in order to align value with price. Well, I'll just say after statins, uh, it took 10 years to get them to 15% market print penetration uh, for whatever reason. And the earlier panel talked about all the barriers in primary care. So I expect, uh, especially if the label requires those expensive PET scans, that actually it'll take a while for that market penetration to get there. I, I want to switch gears for a second, Sarah, because... Our earlier panel had someone from the Alzheimer's Association on it, and we obviously they've been on the front lines uh, of uh, funding innovation, even in this area. You're with AARP, and it's very interesting to me that 
you're here on this panel because as I read, you've got a, a long list of responsibilities that, uh, you know, span things outside of the medical realm. And so could you talk a little bit about why this issue is so important to you? Well, personally, it's important because I'm aging and I have had family members who have lived through dementia and I've been a dementia caregiver, so I get it personally. But professionally, AARP is so interested in this because our mission is to empower people to choose how they will live as they age. And you cannot choose how you will live <laughs> if you don't have your wits about you and you can't manage your funds. And so we extensively survey adults all across the country. And we know that huge majorities, 75% of adults are worried about this issue. And uh, they, the older you are, the more likely you are to know someone with dementia or experience it yourself. And age is the largest non-modifiable age factor for this disease. So ARP is committed to try to improve care, to reduce risk, and for uh, the importance of innovating for a cure. In fact, when we turned 60, we've never done this before, but we invested $60 million in the Dementia Discovery Fund to try to help spark innovation in this field. So it's not that we don't believe in uh, improving diagnostics and treatment. In fact, we think it's vitally important. But we also know that there are other ways to tackle this issue and we need to do it now and not wait for the wonderful cure that is hopefully right around the corner. Um, frankly, um, it impacts people of all ages, of all generations. And the people who it impacts the most are communities of color, older vulnerable people, low income, the social determinants of health, in fact, have a tremendous impact on who develops cognitive decline and how they live when they get it. So this has become a critical issue for AARP. And although I've been at AARP for over 20 years, I am now starting to focus solely on this. And we've created a small department called uh, Policy and Brain Health. And we've been looking into how do you risk cognitive decline early on <laughs> so you never get to these problems. And so you can find ways to save money for the healthcare system as well as individuals. Well, I think we need to do another program on prevention for sure. <laughs> so, uh, and you, Steve, you brought up one of the big barriers, I think, that drives these disparities, which is cost and the copay. Um, you, and you also mentioned that you've been very innovative um, at Cigna in terms of how you pay for gene therapy. Those are very narrow populations, very expensive drugs with a lifetime of benefit. Are you thinking that, but it's also very innovative pricing that you're exploring. Do you think these drugs might be a candidate for a new type of model uh, in the private system? Or are they gonna just be uh, a rebate type model that we've seen uh, for other, uh, other yeah. uh, infused drugs? No, great question. And so I actually am excited that we may be able to do something novel here. So let me give you an, another analogy, and that is diabetes. So diabetes obviously affects 30 million people, yet for many patients, they can't afford their insulin. And as you know, we developed something called the Diabetes Assurance Program, where we said this needs to be simple, predictable, and affordable for patients. So we're going to make the patient's copay for insulin $25.00 regardless of the insulin they're on, the brand, regardless of how much they use in a month. It's $25. And we were able to do this with the pharmaceutical manufacturers by getting them to take money that they were putting into coupon programs or free product programs and getting them to increase, the, to buy down that rebate to $25. And all of the major insulin manufacturers participated in it. And so we've now taken that same concept to CMS to do the same thing in Medicare for insulin. 
And so they didn't choose $25, they choose $35. But the point is, is that it's simple, it's predictable, it's affordable. We're going to need to do more and more of those types of programs for these types of populations, because especially when you have people who are often excluded from the healthcare system, who have real barriers to access, especially because of affordability, we're going to have to do new things. The other point I want to make is when we get to the other side of this pandemic, if you think affordability was the number one issue in healthcare to begin with, because of the way we've been spending money, affordability is going to become even a bigger issue. And so all of us in the ecosystem, from the investigators, through the pharmaceutical manufacturers, to the advocacy organizations, to the payer community, we're all going to have to work together to figure out how we're going to make access and affordability uh, possible in this country, because we have really are going to be tapped out. Uh, that's an excellent point, and it's a great segue to some of the Q&A, because one of the questions we got and is about how CBO might view something like this. And Darius, we know CBO scores with only a 10-year window, and we know CBO really thinks about cost quite a bit, and these drugs are potentially in the short term quite expensive to the Medicare program. What are we going to do? But there may be long-term savings, and especially the questioner is asking about keeping people out of nursing homes. So the first question is, have you looked at that in your modeling in terms of keeping people out of nursing homes? And more generally, what do we need to do on the scoring side to convince Medicare to have the innovative approach that Steve's talking about? Right. That's a great question. Well, I think the answer is it does, uh, it does uh, reduce the risk of nursing home admission. And that, that reduction is, uh, as you might imagine, uh, depends on how, uh, how much cognitive decline is slowed. So as we see future generations of therapies that are more and more effective, we will see bigger and bigger cost offsets. I, I guess as, at a fundamental level, I'd link back to something Sarah said, which is, uh, that fundamentally value is a patient-centered proposition. That's how economists think. Under, underneath all the math and economics, it's just about what patients think is valuable. And the question is, what do patients value? Well, they value reductions in risk. They actually value the reduction in the use of uh, health care. Nobody wants to go into nursing homes or hospitals. Um, so in addition to the direct costs, there are uh, costs to the patient. And I think it's, it is sensible to have a longer time frame because it's really the patient's lifetime horizon that matters here. It shouldn't be an artificial planning horizon. Thank you. Um, another question, anyone else want to comment on that? Go I ahead, just, Sarah. Darius, the point about value and an earlier question that you talked to the previous panel about is clinical trials and the importance of making sure that the clinical trials are looking at the outcomes that individuals would value. In addition to making sure we've got diverse populations who are most at risk for the disease, we have to make sure that the outcomes they're testing for are the outcomes people will value. And that has been a struggle in clinical trials, not only in, with respect to Alzheimer's drugs, but many different kinds of medications. Yeah, so let me uh, comment on that. I <laughs> take the moderator prerogative here. I think one of the issues is when you have very high need, the FDA actually, I think, gets it right because they figure out the biomarkers to get the drugs on the market. I think what Steve is saying, it's up to then the payers, and that includes the government and that includes the private payers, to say, okay, but now we got to figure out the value, and that means... Uh, what is the value actually to patients? So I would argue that the regulators, when it comes to approval, it accelerates access potentially of something more, like, you know, using cholesterol uh, lowering as a marker uh, for PCSK9 made sense, but ultimately we care about reduced hospitalizations, reduced mortality. But, uh, you know, and payers should negotiate that way. So my only qualification of that is we want to make sure the system, the regulators have a different view than the uh, payers. That's all. Um, 
Okay, uh, I want to come back to something you said, Sarah, because we got a question. You were talking about prevention, and a lot of it was about the behaviors uh, of patients uh, engaging in some of the uh, uh, things we can do uh, to make sure we don't experience cognitive decline or try and avoid it. But how do we change the physician culture around prevention? Because there's just, as I said before, the playing field is tilted. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. It's, it's a challenge. Not that they don't want to do the right thing. They really do. Payment, of course, is the huge incentive here. And if you could change payment models to incentivize team-based care and appropriate interventions, that's going to make a big difference. We've certainly seen that in the Affordable Care Act. But I would say that there are basics the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force isn't going to uh, encourage screening until there's an effective treatment. And this medication could conceivably be an effective treatment for some of the people. So if there was a useful medication, I think the healthcare system would be much more eager to deal with diagnosis because they have a tool in their their uh, uh, handbag, if you will, to deal with it. And so I think so much of the challenges that we face and that actually uh, Dr. Cohen described is the healthcare system is reluctant to deal with these issues when presented. The other thing is patients are not going to the healthcare providers and demanding cognitive assessments or evaluations. That's a big problem because they too think that there's nothing that could be done. So it's, it's a combination of changing the framework uh, that perhaps diagnose, diagnostics and treatments will encourage, but we've got to get to the root of that because even where there are payment systems in place, like the Medicare wellness visit, it's not being utilized even though there is a cognitive test available to everybody 65 or older in this country for free basically under the Medicare system. And it's simply not being adequate. It's only by about 20% of Medicare patients. So you really have to get in there and start moving the levers. And CMS of course is, is being asked to look at that and do those kinds of things. But we're going to have to look at it at the same time being able to walk and chew gum to deal with prevention, to deal with the people who are needing care now, but also as new diagnostics and treatments are, are coming. So educating our healthcare system is going to be vital, but driving consumer demand so that healthcare in, uh, providers are actually inspired <laughs> to respond could be a huge lever for change. Thank you. So Steve, uh, and, and thinking about prevention, one of the things we heard from the first panel is that blood-based biomarkers will accelerate clinical trials, make it easier to identify people with disease, and perhaps help with health disparities because of the availability of uh, a biomarker. From a, from a, a, a real-world perspective, what do you think they will do to demand and what impact will, will they have on the spending, for example? Yeah, so great question, uh, Dana. My concern is, is that because you have these biomarkers, the bio, people who want to have these tests done 25 years in advance, you're going to potentially see that you actually have early signs of amyloid accumulation. And the reality is, is that you're going to have a lot, it will drive demand for the product, even though that it wasn't the study group. And so we don't know if it actually works there, but we know it will drive demand. And so we're going to have to really balance this. I want to come back to the prevention thing for one more second, though. Remember that we have a healthcare system that's a sick care system, not a healthcare system. We have figured out in the United States how to reimburse for sick people. We have not figured out how to incent prevention. And that actually doesn't start when you get sick. That actually starts in grade school and earlier. And so if you look at most other countries, they spend a lot of money on prenatal care, early childhood care, childhood nutrition, and other things, because that's where you get the big benefit from your healthcare dollars. 
when you wait to the end to treat Alzheimer's cancer or other things, you spend enormous amounts of money and you only get modest amounts of improvements. And so if we're gonna actually do what you've heard panelists talk about and shift towards prevention, it's gonna to have to take a whole societal cultural change uh, because that's how you get to the things of smoking, obesity, alcoholism, and many other things that we're facing today. Proof actually benefit from this drug, uh, but we're gonna, and it's just gonna represent additional challenges for us. So a lot of different things covered there. So in some way, the, the FDA label and the clinical trials here act as a natural break on that because it, it well, it depends where the FDA label comes out, but it's possible that uh, the early AD group that is eligible for the first wave of treatments will require, they won't be based on some simple biomarker. Yeah. But when you think about patients, what happens is if I want access to it, and I'm going to take a test for cognitive impairment, I actually have the ability to manipulate that, right? Or the provider community that wants to be reimbursed on Part B has a chance to manipulate that. And so this is actually going to be fraught with all sorts of complications for us to get right. Okay. We're going to end on a dark day note, I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> so, Darius, uh, uh, last question for you. We're almost out of time. Your work and your work of your colleagues has shown that in some cases, this works out just fine over the long term. HIV, there was a lot of innovation. It led to a lot of value. The innovators extracted maybe 5 to 7%. It was a little higher, and we worked it out with hep C. Uh, Steve negotiated very hard and prices came down. Where are we going to go with Alzheimer's here? Is this going to be a success story or is this going to be one that we'll be reading about for many years as a failure of our system? I think it's going to be a success, but I think there's a lot of work to do. Um, I think that, that Alzheimer's is more challenging than, than some of these other uh, diseases for a number of reasons that, that we are going to have to treat some people who uh, may not have become severely ill. That's the nature of pre-symptomatic treatment. And that's kind of the cost of doing business. And I'm not, a, uh, just to be clear, I think that's good. It, it, that's, that's the nature of treating in an early stage. You have to accept that, that the number needed to, that uh, sort of the number of people you need to treat is going to be higher. The problem is that we have seen, we have a reimbursement system that is, uh, that is not adapted to um, super effective therapies. The irony is that economists seem to be hoping that we don't get long lasting durable treatment benefits. We should just get drugs that work when you're taking them. And that way the reimbursement system works just fine. We need to move beyond that to a system that can handle gene therapies, that can handle durable benefits from Alzheimer's treatments, other treatments like hep C, so that it will not be the exception, but the rule and I think we know how to do that. CMS has removed some of the regulatory barriers. There's a lot that left, that a lot of script left to be written uh, in LA terms, uh, but I think we can get there. Okay. Uh, any last words, uh, Steve and Sarah? I'm an optimist. I truly <laughs> believe that we're going to figure this out. So we got to do the right thing by patients. If we keep it patient centered, uh, we will get to the right solutions. Sarah? I would say that the other factor to keep included in here are you have to keep caregivers in mind in a, uh, a disease like Alzheimer's in which you have to have people who are helping uh, those with cognitive impairments exist. Radically changing the payment model to actually provide care to or assistance or payments to caregivers who are able to make a huge difference in the cost of long-term care. I know Steve Miller is familiar with um, the St. Louis Memory Care Home Solutions because he's been a great supporter of them for, for many years, where you can actually train dementia care interventions at, uh, people who are providing care and drive down ER visits, drive down hospitalizations. It's a tremendous model. We ought to look more into it. It's my pleasure to be with you guys. I know you'll figure it out and make it happen. 
Thank you. And on that note, uh, that optimistic note, we're going to conclude. I want to thank the panelists, thank the audience uh, for their forbearance, and uh, everyone have a nice day. Take care, everyone. Bye.